punk has been like one of the best kept secrets in the world and we sort of went around and blabbed to everybody about it so. <laughs> From the industrial California town of Rodeo, across the East Bay, childhood friends Billy Joe Armstrong, Mike Dirnt, and Trey Cool grew up on a diet of 60s Brit beat bands like The Kinks, The Who, and all things punk rock. From the high speed pop flex songs of the Ramones and Buzzcocks through to the burgeoning hardcore movement of the early 80s. They were a punk band irrevocably in love with pop music, and they were about to sell millions of albums with this punk pop hybrid, a sound that would soon define the 1990s. I think there's nothing not listening to on that album. A band needs to make that kind of record if they want to be large. Green Day, the time to write. People looking for a band that sounded like that, they had the money and the promotion to make sure everyone knew it was there and it sold. I'd say three quarters of the songs from Dookie you can just bang, you can just hear them, recognize them in a few seconds. Now that is a mark of class. I just knew that I had gotten into something far bigger than I ever imagined before and it nothing was going to be the same again anymore. Hey, we are the best. We are the best, but, you know, hey, we don't want to go floating and, you know, some things are best unsaid. It all started when two 11-year-old friends, Billy Joe Armstrong and Mike Pritchard, met one day in the school canteen. The two friends had been playing their songs at home for a couple of years, when in 1987, they decided to recruit a drummer for their garage band. His name was John Kiffmeyer, but everyone knew him as Al Sobrante. Together, the three teens became Sweet Children, a tongue-in-cheek moniker lifted from their song of the same name. They came out of the whole kind of punk club scene. Punk really started in America with things like the Stooges, and over here we know punk as the Sex Pistols, but they came out very much from the American end of it, which was sort of punk put through the rock and roll sausage machine. So they, they were a lot more American sounding, although they later claimed to sort of have the, the Pistols and the Damned and all these British bands as their main influence. Actually, they really couldn't be from anywhere but from America. <laughs> In the earliest days of Sweet Children, the trio began hanging around the recently opened all-ages punk rock venue, 924 Gilman Street in the East Bay. The Gilman scene was a place where young punk fans could hang out and form bands, start record labels, or fanzines. A close-knit community that prided itself on its punk ethics. A whole bunch of us uh, built it from scratch, you know, like took jackhammers to the, to the floor and busted it up and put in, uh, put it in the toilets, uh, built the stage, put, it, put in the wiring, I almost electrocuted myself doing that and started putting on shows and it, it flourished. It was, it was amazing, one of those miracles that actually happens and it's still going today, uh, like 19 years later. A lot of people felt like there was all this local talent that didn't have any place to play 
And by having this place suddenly that people were able to create, um, a lot of people came out of the woodwork, a lot of people that had been around were able to focus on that. And it had, um, and still has, um, uh, a kind of a unifying effect. You know, people have affection for the place. The Gilman Street was great because there's a sense of community. There wasn't like a, you'd be based over in England and there'd be no community at all. There was a strong punk rock community and because it's a very ethical punk rock club, there's a real sense of identity to it and there's a very sense of lifestyle to it. It must have been fantastic. I mean, you're still going Gilman Street. It's a really cool venue. When Green Day formed in 1987, no one, least of all the members, expected to make a living out of it. The band caught the eye of local label Lookout, whose founder, Larry Livermore, had seen the band playing at a party and had likened them to the early Beatles. I remember Billy especially stood out. I mean, they put on a, a show of their life. It was, it was as if I said right there, it was like the Beatles at Shea Stadium. He had that same attitude, that same command, as if he were playing to 60,000 people. You know, kind of a mixture of uh, affection and disdain. You know, you know, he was already a rock star, even though it was just like these five kids sitting on the floor, you know, and, and, and at the same time, he was really warm and inclusive, you know, he, he, he like talked to them and said, thanks for coming and I really appreciate you being here. It was, it was, uh, it was just, you know, before it was two or three songs into it, um, I said, well, I'm going to make a record with these guys. And I told him so when, when Billy asked me afterwards, you know, kind of in his like shy 16 year old way, well, would you? What did you think? Were we all right? And I says, I want to make a record with you guys. And he says, oh, okay. <laughs> and that was, that was the beginning. In November 1988, Sweet Children made the leap from audience to stage when they began performing at Gilman regularly. And they became like the house band there. They'd always be the first on. They were just like little kids, 15, 16 years old. First band on every single bill. That virtually played there for like every night, really. That's how they got their chops together. And they just played there, built up a following there. I mean, they're part of all that kind of uh, sort of late 80s California kind of punk scene, bands like Operation Ivy, who became Rancid. But those kind of bands played there as well. And Green Day got kind of friends, all these people. So you can see the little infrastructure build up. They started to play Gilman a lot and developed kind of quite a following. And by, maybe by the end of 89, they'd they played quite a lot of shows and they were starting to get a reputation as a band that a lot of girls liked. And that was among some of the punks that was kind of supposed to be a bad thing because if, if all the, the girls came from the suburbs and stood up front and danced and, and sort of looked dreamy eyed at the band then that meant you were a sellout or a poser. And so some of the more hardcore punks were sneering at them, making fun of them. But, you know, the, the band didn't seem to mind. Livermore agreed to finance the high schooler's earliest recordings. The 1,000-hour single, recorded cheaply and quickly, and released in 1989. They went in and recorded four songs, and then it came up down to about three weeks before the record was due to be released in April of 1989. And still no artwork for the cover. We had a bunch of uh, seven-inch records, but no, no covers, no, no lyrics, no title, nothing. And and then uh, they came to me and said, well, we've tried to, we decided to change our name and we want to call ourselves Green Day. And I went, no, you can't do that. That's crazy. Everybody knows you as sweet children. By everybody, I mean the maybe 500 or 1,000 people we were hoping might buy the record. And he says, well, I, we, it's too late. We've decided, you know, sweet children's dumb and it's too much like Sweet Baby, which was another Gilman band. And and I said, well, we, we don't, how can we, how can we do this? And he said, well, we'll, we'll just do it. And I, I learned then there was a couple of the bands I worked with, you know, there was no point in arguing with. They, they would decide and they would announce it to the label and that was that. And so, although I said Green Day is a stupid name, it doesn't mean anything and so on and so on. It, we, we stuck to it and at the, at the last minute, uh, my, my partner in the label at that time, David Hayes, just sort of drew a logo for Green Day and said, well, we'll call it by the name of the first song on the record, 1,000 Hours. And we, we went off to the um, copy shop and Xeroxed 1,000 sheets of paper with that on it and folded them up and stuck them into a plastic bag with each record. And that was, the, that was their first record. It came out in early April of 89, 1,000 Hours. 
We, we pressed a thousand of the first uh, seven inch and it kind of built up fairly slowly. I think it probably only sold a few hundred at first and then over the course of the year probably sold out its first pressing of a thousand and, and then, then picked up quite a bit. Soon the band were recording their full-length debut album, 39 Smooth, over one weekend in San Francisco. That came out in April of 1990, and that's when we first knew that something big was happening. When we did a a record release party in April of 1990 at Gilman, and it was not just for Green Day, it was for um, another band, uh, sort of a more met metallic rock type band called Neurosis, who were pretty big at the time. And when we got there, we were my, uh, one, of, one of the kids that was working with me uh, and I, we, we arrived at the, at the gig with a whole boxes of records to, to sell. And, and I was driving and Chris, who was with me, said, Holy cow, look at this, Larry. And, and I looked up and there were, they, were, they were queued up all the way down the, down the street. There was, a, there was a 500, 800 people standing outside and, and it, waiting to get into Gilman for just like a Lookout Records re release show. It was pretty mind-blowing, I mean, honestly, because we knew things had been building up, but nothing, not to that extent. <laughs> We were selling records hand over fist uh, to the point where we had no place to put the money anymore. It was like half, about 3 a.m. We were, we were driving back and we were still uh, like pulling, keep finding like, you know, where we'd stuff more wads of money into in this pocket and that pocket and uh, we'd sold out every single record we'd, we'd brought to that, to that gig. It was hard. It was hard to believe that like something we'd started had had turned into this. It was, it was almost kind of scary. The first album, Green Days, it sounds like a band fully formed. The songwriting is there. It's just a production, which isn't quite as good. But of course, it wouldn't be because the band haven't got as much money. They haven't played as many gigs, and they're young, you know. So. But if you took those songs and re-recorded them with the budgets they had later on, five years later, a lot of those songs will fit into any of those albums. It seems to be full of songs about girls. I think there's like only two, two other tracks on there that, that don't talk about some kind of angst relationship with, with girls. And you can't expect 15, 16, 17 year olds to write these great, you know, three verses on the de deconstructing the political situation in America. I mean, it is about spots, boys and girls and fart jokes. I mean, that's basically where you're at when you're 15 or 16 and Green Day, we're kind of mirroring that very well. It's pretty badly written. Um, the musicianship is quite poor. Uh, the drumming is, is all over the place, but but then again, I suppose it's punk music, and in fact, it's probably the most punky that they ever sound. They've come from 1987 Sweet Children EP down to um, 39 Smooth in 1990, and they've made quite, uh, you know, there's been quite a, a growth within the band, and it is kind of quite a mixed bag, but there's enough in it to kind of hint what the band will become. All was going well until John decided to give up the pursuit of punk stardom in favor of a college education. This would turn out to be the crucial turning point in Green Day's career when they hooked up with fellow Gilman graduate Frank Edwin Wright III, better known as Trey Cool, a precocious and hyperactive drummer with local band The Lookouts. Though Trey came from the remote mountain town of Willits, by his mid-teens, he was already a fixture on the Berkeley punk scene with a reputation as a promising drummer and a nose for mischief. He was the perfect candidate to fill the vacant Green Day drum stool. He had joined the band at the end of 1990 after our band kind of sputtered out. 
and say it did create a, a new sound. I mean, John was a good drummer, but not a great drummer. He, he was competent and he had a lot of energy and, and spirit. But, but Trey, by this time, had become you know, a genuinely great drummer. And it, it was a new level of, of performance that the band was capable of now. So in 1991, with Trey on board, they recorded their second album, Kerplunk. Their first as the Green Day lineup we know today. The album showcased Billy Joel's talent for writing songs that combine the melodies of British bands of the 60s with the energy of 70s punk rock and 80s hardcore. In those days, we often would take the, the tape down to Los Angeles to, to have it mastered. And I liked to go down because there was this, this engineer guy who'd been doing it since the 60s. And he, you know, it was almost as much just because I'd get to sit around with him and hear stories about Frank Sinatra and, and Frank Zappa and, and all of the other and the Beach Boys and all these other bands he'd, he'd worked with. And he would just sit there and tell stories while he was doing the settings on, on our tapes. But, and then at the end, he'd give me a cassette and I'd listen to it on the, on the way back back home. And I, I got onto the plane and put it on a, a Walkman. And the minute the first chords kicked in, I just said, whoa, this is something way bigger than I had ever expected. It was the, the first song, I think it was 2,000 Light Years Away, on, on the first song on Kerplunk. I mean, I'd heard it a bunch of times before, but now that it was mastered and ready to become a record, I just. I just knew that I had gotten into something far bigger than I'd ever imagined before and that nothing was going to be the same again anymore. And it wasn't. It was the beginning of quite a, a wild ride. Kaplunk is a, it's actually a, a good good record really I mean the the band have learned to play their instruments so they've, they've got Trey cool in I think he just totally tightens up the rhythm section um, and uh, basically the band seem as though they've they've traveled they've done the gigging circuit and they've listened to their original recording and they've they've just really stepped up you know um, as a result the album um, Kaplunk just sounds far more together it shows a tighter band I think they're playing uh, better off of each other and with each other um, and you know they're functioning more as a as a band and also their, their style is a little more fixed now whereas with 39 Smooth it was a bit more mixed up with different things uh, Kaplunk is, is definitely a Green Day sort of album um, it's still recorded in the kind of the same kind of trashy way as as the first one it's got there's songs that Welcome to Paradise is on there and I think that that song is definitely the first time we see a little sparkle of what the next sort of album would bring. Welcome to Paradise on there, which is like the first Green Day kind of mini classic really. It's a song which they still play live now and then. It's like 
and it's a song they re-released later on. And it's a great song, it's, a, it's got all the hallmarks, everything has got like big hits and later on. And 2000 Light Years Away was on there as well, which is another really good track. But the, the song right across the whole album is again really, really good, it's really, really strong. And there's a, there's a little slight bit of diversification on there, it's not all just straight pop punk, there's a couple of other instruments chucked into the mix and things. Or, well, there's a lot less songs about girls and relationships and angsty stuff like that. I think, I think um, Billy Joe actually starts getting into lyric writing, which is perhaps what we associate more with Green Day, which is the, um, you know, kind of more of the mental turmoil. You know, he seems to write more songs about his brain and things like that. And that obviously becomes quite a sort of trademark for Dookie later. Kaplunk actually needed to happen before they could realistically get signed to a bigger label. They needed to, to, to stick their head up above the, their competition and actually sound like a band with potential. With proper digs in the basement at 2243 Ashby Street, the guys were now living, eating and breathing as one band. The band had little in the way of money and did the odd menial job to get by between playing increasingly bigger tours. There's this kind of period during, from about 1990 to 1992. I always wondered how they survived. I mean, I, I was paying them regular royalties from their record sales, but it, which was, was a help, but it wasn't enough to live on. And their lifestyle was pretty chaotic. I mean, they were a bunch of kids who just left home and had never lived on their own before. And I knew that while John was still in the band, he was the one that took care of all the money and making sure they got up in time to get to the gig. And, you know, he was kind of the, the, the mum of the band, really. And once he was gone, though, I mean, and, and he was replaced with Trey. I mean, Trey was the most chaotic of all. So I, I would stop and think sometimes, well, how are they paying their bills? Who's taking care of the money? I mean, how is this working? You know, when we started, we started our band, we never thought in a million years that we would end up where we are right now because it was anyone before us, it never happened. So, you know, uh, but, you know, it's like I always just try to treat it just, you know, another day and I just don't even think about it, you know, just having a good time and, and uh, you know, doing what we feel is right, you know. One of the things that was always uh, endearing about them is they were excited just to play. They just, they, they didn't really worry too much about, about, in fact, they didn't worry about money at all or, or fame or, or records. It was, it was kind of part of my, partly my job to get them to concentrate long enough to, to make a record. Because um, they were, as, as long as there was a gig to play and, and if they weren't playing, they would be probably sitting around jamming on their guitars. Um, it was, they were happy. Welcome to it was kind of me, to, I think, in a way that kept going at them and saying, look, you know, people are really buying the record, people really like you, you know, you can, you can be serious about this. And like, they were kind of like, oh, I don't want to be that serious, I want to have fun. It was live that Green Day built their reputation playing everywhere and anyway, including in 1991, a hectic European tour that saw the band playing everywhere from squats to snooker halls. It was all like sort of uh, very kind of hand-to-mouth touring. It was like little clubs, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a van. Some, some kids here from the UK were driving them. It, uh, they weren't making any money, but they were paying their own way, and which was, which was which was good because they didn't have any other jobs and they had you know, as long as they stayed on the road they had a place to sleep and they had and they had something to eat and I think that was kind of their attitude. Well, I did see them on the first tour, but they weren't really that known. I mean, I remember seeing them. There's about 30 people at the gig in, in Newport, Wales, and they were they were great. But they were, again, it was because you couldn't really place them into the scene because they were were a very kind of Nirvana kind of esque pre-Nirvana getting massive era, but it's, it's all that kind of it, things going on there, there's grunge going on, there wasn't, there's no space of pop punk in Britain then, it wasn't really kind of a known scene. So, so yeah, you, you kind of seen, but when you see them then playing then, it's not really a massive different show to what they do now. It's still like goofing about great songs without, you know, just there wasn't 14,000 people watching it. That carried on well into 1992 and, but, but by that time, some of the, the gigs were starting to get pretty big and they were starting to make some serious money Still mostly DIY gigs, but 
you know, when you get you know, 500 or 600 kids turning up, that can turn into some serious money, I mean, by their standards. Soon, on word of mouth alone, 39 Smooth and Kerplunk had notched up sales of 50,000 copies each, and it was clear they needed some help taking care of their business affairs. Lookout was a very small label. For a label uh, operating at the level that Lookout was, to sell 50,000 copies was really pushing the limits of what they could do. And I know that Green Day were going out on tour uh, at that point, maybe 91 or 92, I think, 93. They weren't able to find the records in stores. Their distribution wasn't that great. And, and, they, and Lookout really didn't help them to book shows. Um, they needed a more professional way of doing things than they had been. I think they realized that they'd gotten a little too big to just do it themselves. They were one of the, the bands that didn't take a lot of hands-on energy. I mean, the main thing I had to do was keep the records pressed, uh, write them their checks. Each uh, We paid the bands quarterly and I had to keep them paid and uh, answer questions, really. You know, like they'd say, What's, how's that work or what are we going to do here? And I would tell them, Sometimes I didn't, I didn't, you know, as they toured more and more, I didn't see them as much as I used to. I mean, they used to be they'd just drop by and hang out, and now sometimes I wouldn't see them for a month or two at a time. And that continued on into 93, and it was in 93 when the rumors started really flying that, oh, the majors are interested in them. They chose two attorneys, Elliot Kahn and Jeff Saltzman, who had previously represented bands such as Mudhoney. Primus, and the Melvins. They got to work touting the band's latest demo to all the major record labels. I think it must have been sometime in the spring of 93, the rumors really started flying and people started asking me, what are you going to do now if you don't have Green Day? I mean, um, and I said, well, I don't know anything about it. Uh, they, they haven't told me, and I haven't even seen them for, for about three or four weeks. And then I ran into Trey, and I said, what's, what's going on? I hear all these stories. And he kind of hemmed and hawed, which was unlike Trey. Usually he's, you know, well, they called him Motor Mouse, and he, you know, a mile a minute talking about everything. And he just was kind of, obviously, but I'd known him since he was like nine years old. He, he couldn't, you know, like do, get away with that too long. So I, he finally said, well, uh, yeah, we're talking to this management kind of agency. And I says, oh, well, you know, were you planning on telling me? And, you know, why don't you get the other guys and we'll talk about it? And so we, we went down to a, a nearby cafe and, and you know, it quickly came out that they weren't just talking, that they'd pretty much already signed a deal with these two uh, managing, managing, management guys who had mostly worked in with metal bands before, like Exodus and The Possessed, things like that. Uh, who kind of knew nothing about the scene, but who had promised to get them a major label deal. Uh, this is off one of our records that no one has. I mean, I'd seen a lot of bands by that time signed to major labels on the basis of having sold 10 or 20,000 records. The majors would, you know, t put out a record. It, if it didn't sell a lot, they'd be dropped, and that would be they'd be history, just like that. And, and I thought it would be a real tragedy if that happened to them. But as as it turned out, they proved to be the exception. Uh, you know, the one out of 100 that, that hit it hit it big right from from the start. The band quickly found themselves the subject of a bidding war that ended when they decided to sign with Reprise Records A&R man and producer Rob Cavallo. Signing to a major label created division in the punk scene that had spawned Green Day. Some critics claiming the band had sold out and could never be credible again. Others recognized the new opportunities and financial backing available to a band who had always applied a pop sensibility to songwriting. So what difference did it make? I just want to lie, lie. Well, I just want to lie, lie. 
Green Day were, were destined to be going around in ever decreasing circles, playing to their fan base. But the moment they signed to a major label, that was their that was their chance to really dive into the spotlight. I think they knew how good they were. I mean, they've always been fairly confident bands, but I think they were, they were sat down when they were writing these songs thinking, well, why not? We could have hits with these. Lookout can't do it. I don't, there was, it, was, it was nothing down on Lookout. I mean, Lookout was a good, big underground label, but to get right to mainstream these days, it's not the 1970s anymore. It's, it's, this is the 90s. You had to, you had to deal with the monster to get into the mainstream. So they, they did the right thing, they signed to Major. They could have signed to Epitaph, who's, be, who's becoming the very the biggest punk label a lot of the time. But where, the way Billy Joe says it, why should I sign from, go from one independent label to another independent, bigger independent label? That's an insult to Lookout. You know, if you're gonna leave Lookout, go to the biggest label you possibly can, and that's what he did. Independent labels give you a lot of credibility, but ultimately the reality means you're not gonna get played on radio or on mainstream radio. You're not gonna get played on TV and you're not gonna get um, cool, critics talking about you because ultimately in simple terms people aren't going to hear about it. Being signed to a large label like Reprise would mean that suddenly they were able to have the budget, have the studio time, have the uh, distribution sources in place, you know, be able to sort of look at Europe and and um, generally have the support of a, of a massive, uh, you know, um, commercial business behind them. If you're on an indie label selling 50,000 records, you know, maybe you go to a major label and sell twice that many. You're considered a failure in major label standards, but you'd be a huge indie band. But if you're going to sell 10 million records, yeah, sign with the major label, but you can't predict that. Do you have the time to listen to me whine? Armed with a number of new compositions, Green Day enter Berkeley's Fantasy Studios to begin work on their breakthrough album, Dookie, with their equally young A&R man, Rob Cavallo, producing. Though they were now entering the arena of the major label rock band, the plan was a simple one, to keep on doing what they did best. And for Green Day, that involved penning short, sharp, melodic songs about the subjects both they and their audience knew about. Sexual frustration, boredom, poverty, and angst. But rather than being downbeat, Green Day's approach was one of energy, humor, and excitement. When Dookie came out, the whole thing had changed. You know, the, you, you've got like um, rocks gone mainstream. You know, the, the Nirvana kicked open the doors. There's a huge space, people listening, and there's this, and you know, there's a, like a big grunge scene. But I think a lot of people picked up Nirvana because actually like the punk rock edge of Nirvana. They liked it because it was energetic. A lot of the grunge bands are actually pretty dull. You know, they're pretty boring. I thought a lot of the, the grunge bands were nothing but arena rock bands. But you know, but you know, with they haven't washed their hair. <laughs> they were boring. It was all introverted, and it really didn't say anything. I think lyrically people picked up on the, uh, you're, you're, you're not a macho rock star, you're just a kid getting kicked about kind of thing. And I think Green, Green Day picked up, not didn't copy those lyrics, they write those kind of lyrics anyway. The kind of, you know, this small town loser, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm the spotty kid, sod you kind of lyrics, which, which Nirvana wrote, it's kind of introspective, but Green Day did a lot more humour, probably a little less depth. And those kind of things hit a nerve. There was all of these sort of grunge bands. You know, there was, you know, the Pearl Jams and the, and the Sound Gardens. And, and I just felt like we were a wrecking ball that was ready to just destroy the house that grunge built. I wouldn't say they tapped into the zeitgeist in the way that Nirvana did, but what I, what I think Green Day did was actually um, give voice to the concerns and um, habits of what their fans were into, you know, and that is, that's, that's a, a clever trick. Welcome to Paradise. And Green Day wrote fun songs about quite light topics most of the time, I would say. You know, so actually kids could bounce around, you know, listening to their records. And they were exciting sounding records, so the, the, uh, vibe that came off of those records, you could almost smell it. You write the songs, you record them, three months later a record comes out, then you're out taking over the world, hopefully. Oh, 
welcome to The band worked quickly and easily. The bulk of Dookie had been written by Billy Joe Armstrong during time off the road in 1993 in his basement Berkeley flat, surrounded by empty beer cans, clothes, and broken equipment. Welcome to Paradise was the song that bridged the gap between the scuzzy teen punks of old with the newly wealthy major label recording stars. A live favorite, the song was the highlight of their previous Lookout album, Kerplunk, and deemed too good to resign to the past. Welcome to Paradise was very significant in, in terms of the development of the band because it was actually probably the first Green Day song that anyone heard that addressed anything more than teenage angst and, you know, the issues of a teenager growing up in America. Timothy, can you hear me laughing? Let's spend take so much switch that I have a girl and while it wasn't a, exactly what you would call a political song, it was about as political as they got at that time. If you compare the uh, single, what, what I thought of as a single for Kaplunk, um, Welcome to Paradise, you can actually compare those two mixes and what Rob Cavallo does to it is what it's all about, what it's all about in taking a band up to that level where, where you're, you're going to hawk them around the world. <laughs> Green Day's policy had always been to develop their songs to such a degree that recording was quick and uncomplicated, an approach born out of punk's DIY attitude. This worked well on their first album with Lookout, Kerplunk. The record sounded great with pared down production that comes when there is little budget. And now, despite the backing of a commercial record company, Billy Joel laid down all his vocals for Dookie in the space of two days. His work amounted to 16 songs. Some of those that made it onto the album were recorded in the first take. The band had entered their most productive period yet. I think Green Day were inspired by the what you call the original punk bands. I just think no one else knew it apart from them. You know, I think you, if you actually spoke to them, they would say they were in, inspired by the Ramones and the Sex Pistols. But it was very much a kind of safe and homogenized version of it. It didn't have that kind of element of danger about it. But ultimately, you know, they recorded Dookie, as far as I know, in a few days. That's pretty punk rock. I mean, I remember Trey coming around and, and saying, well, we've been working on my drum sounds for six weeks now or something like that. I mean, I might be exaggerating slightly, but, you know, we were used to recording albums in, in two or three days. And that's how we'd done both of them. Their first one was done in a, a day and a half, and their second one, I think, took four days. And, and they spent the whole summer, I don't know, and, and more doing that record. There was no excess fat in a, in a Green Day song, so it was very much don't bore us, get to the chorus. They said everything they needed to say in two or three minutes, which is exactly what the punk bands did. It's kind of in the same way that I said that, like when Billy was playing to those five kids in that shack, I mean, it was like he was already on stage at, uh, at a stadium playing like to 1,000, 60,000 60, people. It was that same kind of feeling. He was had been ready all his life to, to, to walk into this big studio and make this big record. So now they were having the time of their life on that on that record, I mean, and I think it I think it shows through. I mean, the songs are all all classic Green Day. The performances are perfect. I mean, I think they loved making that record, and I, I think I mean I talked to them many times afterwards, and they were always very happy with it. In a in a kind of successful band's history, 
the bands that kind of go on and move on and to, to become stellar really um, at some stage or other are going to do a record um, yeah. like in Green Day's case Dookie um, and what's interesting about that is that you you hear Rob Cavallo who produces that record hearing perhaps how the band can sound and recognizing that you know it's all about the guitars <laughs> I'm taking the sound and I'm blowing it up to major label quality, but I'm not going to bastardize or change um, the, the sonic quality of it because we have to have that integrity. We wanted to really capture the energy of what we did live. We wanted a record to reflect who we were as a band. You know, $500 recording that style and put it on a big budget with more time and more time to get bigger sounds. I remember them as being like a total learning experience. It was like, it was like we were going to college every day to some extent. We showed up at like 12 noon every day and we left at like 12 or 1 o'clock every night and we made sure that we got great takes. When it's produced that way, it almost kind of softens it a little bit. Um, it gives it that sort of lighter feel. But it's, it's again, it's, it's, a, it's a strange one because Green Day have always had sort of good harmonies and melodies and stuff, so that in itself would add a lighter feel to, to it. So it was, I, think, I think it was bound to be a great record and a, a lighter record. Uh, so what the production has done in this case, which is obviously a sign of good production, is just let it be what it is. It was the kind of music they'd been playing for years and it was a chance to play it to a... Uh, with a, in, a, in an excellent studio with an excellent producer and to a to a huge audience I mean it was just everything was in place and I think they were having the time of their life I think they loved it I was alone I was all by myself no one was looking I was thinking of you Though the band were making a career-defining record, their entire existence was based on fun and frivolity, an attitude borne out by the album's hidden track, All By Myself, a joke song recorded at a party featuring Trey on vocals. The band later claimed it was a song about masturbation, a recurring topic in the world of Green Day. I didn't think that, that you know, masturbation was really looked at from the point of view that I was sort of looking at it, you know, it always seemed more people just pulling a putt or something, but I feel like mine was coming from more like lonely guy, no girlfriend, no life, complete loser. The few people who heard Dookie at these early stages recognized the album's potential. The record was all about the reality of modern American life for the young and the lost. It was a collection of songs written by Billy Joe, someone unafraid to brand himself as idiotic or a stoned outsider. Yet the irony was, Green Day were smart. From day one, they are a very good pop punk band who write really brilliant catchy songs. That's what Green Day are on this planet for. They're not just planning to be experimental. I mean, a lot of bands make this mistake. They think, hmm, maybe we should do something really experimental. They can't. You know, Green Day is smart. They know they write great songs with great choruses. And pretty well what they do is a pop punk kind of thing, which they kind of got some tangents on it later on. But the central chorus of their sound, which is already there in the first album, is really great, sharp, short songs of really good pop punk. Green Day were a fusion of pop, punk and rock. And that is a very difficult combination to get right, in the right order. You know, it's like baking a cake. So ultimately, in terms of selling that many records and, you know, really infiltrating the mainstream, it's you've got to get that combination perfect in order to do that to people that don't buy those kind of records normally. In April 1994, the rock world was stunned when the Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain took his own life. With his passing, grunge lost its appeal and the doors were open for a new breed of bands to storm the charts. They had an entirely different outlook on life, and leading the way was Green Day. They had released Dookie's first single, Longview, just three months before Cobain's suicide, the perfect antidote to the damaged psyche of rock music. The whole Nirvana thing had sort of had its first peak. It had been two and a half years since Nevermind came out when Dookie came out. I think they were like the they they stepped into that void where people are saying, "Hmm, what's next? What's coming along?" Uh, and it was them. I 
that song came about at Billy's house. He had this riff. He doesn't. And he played that. And then Mike started going. Oh, do, 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 do. And I started doing that thing. And, and it's a real menacing quality about it. And, you know, so the lyrics, I just wanted something that was like, you know, kind of a schizophrenic kind of thing where it just, there's this sort of rolling bass line that happens and this sort of smooth feel, and then all of a sudden it just blasts into Longview was almost like a script from, you know, an episode of Beavers and Butthead. It really was, you know. And the band that recorded Dookie are a far away band from the band that recorded, you know, A Thousand Hours. And I think that this is when Trey Cool is now in his own, and I think that Billy Joe Armstrong and Mike Dern are working with each other very well. In songs like Longview, the three of them are just one unit. You know, they're three, three separate parts, but they're sitting together as one unit, and it, it's sounding... It, it's got the kind of vibe of a band that a band should have. And I think that comes from extensive touring and, you know, those the previous years working up to Dookie. Right before Christmas of 93, there was a, a really small but kind of cult favorite band called Brent's TV, and they had broken up a year or two before, but they were going to do a reunion show at Gilman. And right, I think it was either the day before Christmas or the day after Christmas, and uh, it was sort of just like a couple hundred people that knew the band were going to come, and, and Green Day said they wanted to play, but they would play under a fake name because by this time they were way too big to, you know, they would we'd be swamped with kids if, if anybody knew Green Day were playing. So. They, they they played under a fake name, and there was about 150 or 200 of us, and it was just kind of, you know, just sort of like family. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew all the words to all the songs of both Brent's TV and, and Green Day, and we all kind of sang along and, and sort of reminisced. And there was this, I don't know if anybody said it out loud, but there was this feeling hanging over the whole night that it would never be like this again. And it, and it wasn't, because the next, next month, uh, and Dookie came out, and, and MTV got involved, and it was just, uh, you know, almost instant sensation. And suddenly, not just Green Day, but our whole scene and everything we'd been doing was under a microscope for the whole country. Uh, and it was all, well, like I said, we'd never be the same again. It's exciting, but you know, something, something new had come in, but something, you know, really delicate and precious was gone too. When Dookie was released in January of 1994, Green Day's reputation was just beginning to spread. The band had their critics, mostly their old fans, a large section of the punk community, who had turned their back on Green Day for signing to a major. Despite this, the band saw their fan base swell considerably. The striking cartoon style artwork meant that the new fans could hold their own mini East Bay punk scene in their hands. And here was a record that was more than straight punk rock. Their songs crossed the boundaries between punk, pop, hard rock, and hardcore. Dookie began to sell lots. I think the critical reaction to Dookie was actually very mixed. I think a lot of critics over here were very um, suspicious of them. And this whole kind of like, we're a punk rock band. It's like, well, no, you're not. You're a bunch of American kids. And they didn't look dangerous enough to be a credible punk rock band over here or to be perceived as a credible punk rock band over here. Whereas in America, I think uh, critics are actually less cynical until you get to the real kind of the much cooler echelons of music criticism. Um, I think in America, people were kind of much more into it because, you know, ultimately they could see the power of those songs. We'd, we'd already heard some of the songs anyway. They'd been playing them at gigs for a while before. And in a lot of ways, it was the same exact style of music as they'd been playing all along, only with massively better production. But it, um, the record never connected with me as much as it, it did with most people. I don't know why. Maybe it was just my prejudice that it wasn't on my label. And it, it's just something about it. And I don't think it's just because it's a new Green Day record not on my label, because um, their, their one they came out with last year, American Idiot, is my favorite of all. 
and that's that's both on a major label and fairly different in style. I didn't get as into it as I did the the first two records. I mean, it's a, it's a, a great record, a classic record, but something about it doesn't doesn't grab me as much. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know why. It's, there's there's such so many great songs on it, and you know that people still listen to today. <laughs> Just a really awesome opening intro, a really very simple intro, but it, it, you couldn't help but just sort of think, well, what's going on here? And there's a really great intensity to how that song opens up. It was a perfect three minute punk pop song. When you get to know the song and it kicks in to the, to the guitars coming in, I mean, it's just, you know, it's a real rush. Basket Case is such an amazing song because it has hooks running through it from start to finish. And it's a kind of exciting, exhilarating punk pop song. And it's one of those songs you actually don't get bored of listening to, which is the, it actually, I think it probably gets better with age, which is, and that is the mark of a good song. Um, and I think it was their kind of real calling card. It's certainly the song I associate with that record. Dookie was the album that took Green Day's highly infectious sound to the world. With the album complete, the band hit the road first with the melodic punk legend's Bad Religion, then with a series of career-defining festival performances, including Woodstock, Lollapalooza, and their own arena shows. I think playing all the festivals and being a great live band was great, but there's so many factors why that record did really well. I think people, there was a feeling that a lot of kind of the kids, you know, the young kids, the mild kids, the post Nirvana generation were looking for another band, you know, and, and Green Day came along. It was, it's, they touched on similar themes, but they touched them in a different kind of way. But, I mean, it's, they had that kind of, kind of potty humour that's very big in America, but there's also a seriousness to the record as well. They're really good songs, every single song on the record is like a little mini anthem of its own. I mean, they're really, really dead catchy songs. Really well produced, great videos as well. MTV picks up on them, which is a very important fact as well. MTV very rarely plays any guitar rock music, no matter what it says. And they picked up on Green Day, that helps a lot. Play, playing the festivals helped a lot. Woodstock put them right into the mainstream, like it was, it was in proper news in America, where, where they got covered in mud on the stage. And they, they actually, you know, there's always one band that comes away the festivals are champions, and they really did. They, that was, they, they were the talk of the festival. <laughs> Woodstock was a complete disaster, but Green Day kind of escapulated everything that was, that was about that festival. Was, you know, they, they, they took the piss out of it. It was all, all over the television. There was mud flying. There was like loads of really funny comments. So they became the band of the festival, got loads of headlines off that. That bumped the sales of the record up. Hey, everybody say shut the fuck up and we'll stop playing. Wait, one, two, three. Okay, we're gone. Goodbye. There's so many things went right from that year. You know, sometimes when you're in a band, everything goes right. It's not like most times it's like everything goes wrong. But then that year, everything's like bang, 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 like a load of skills went down. It was right. They delivered a great record and everything went right, you know, with it, the promotion, the timing, everything was perfect. <laughs> A year after its release, the album had sold a staggering 5 million copies worldwide, won numerous awards, and seized the post grunge zeitgeist. Green Day had entered the major league and were reaping all the financial rewards that comes from international success. Aside from the music, the punks had left one other lasting impression on Green Day. As they saw themselves outselling the biggest pop, rock, and rap stars of the day, the band remained humble and self deprecating preferring to stick with what they knew best. I don't know, I don't really succumb to what, whatever the business has to offer. I just, you know, I'm, I do my own thing. You know, it's tough, you know. There, you get a lot of demons that uh, lurk around and, you know, want you to be something else, but 
you know, you just got to put walls up and have the right people around you. And it's, it's about friends and family, you know. As they got bigger, as the Longview video started to take off and their audience became more mainstream, they started seeing people at their shows that never would have been at their shows in the past acting in ways that they weren't used to. And essentially they had reached the mainstream audience and the mainstream audience sometimes acted like a bunch of jerks at the shows. And they thought, hmm, let's get Pansy Division, the openly gay band, to show that you know we are not just your normal typical rock band. There were, there were two shows where the promoters did not want us to play and Green Day said well if Pansy Division won't play then we won't play the gig and that was a, a measure of support for us but it was also a, a, a line in the sand for them saying you know if, you know, if, if we're big enough to do uh, to sell all these records we should be able to do what we want to do on this level. So if we can't even pick our opening band, you know, forget you. You're just mad because you're in the rain. Well, fuck you. I hope it rains so much you all get stuck. By having us along, they were saying that, you know, Hold look, we, we may be on a major label. We may be yeah. having our videos on MTV, but we are going to do things our own way. Something's on my mind. It's been for quite some time. It's my mind to him. So it's the other face, the face I made for your exit for me. Over the next 10 years, they would go on to release a series of albums that enjoyed huge success, but not quite as stratospheric as Dookie. Their lowest selling album would still notch sales of 2 million copies. Though 2000 Warning suggested a band maturing into singer-songwriter territory, 2004's American Idiot firmly re-established Green Day as the biggest punk band in the world, and even surpassed the sales of Dookie. They are now the biggest punk band ever, and judging by their latest record, it's a position they have no intention of relinquishing. Now, I don't think it's remotely surprising that Green Day have staying power, because however snobby you want to be about Green Day, they had better songs than all of their peers. Well, that's what, when a band's great, when it, it doesn't deviate too far from what it's really good at, but it can do loads of different little versions of what it's really good at, and that's what Green Day have found. I think, that's their kind of key strength. And they'll be, they'll be around for a long time. They're in for the long haul. As long as they want to be there, they'll be there, Green Day. So any criticisms about whether they're true punk or not, well, maybe that is kind of true punk, and you know, they're still doing what they want to do. Yeah.